This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. We see him as a, a legacy person for the whole South. Born during one of the most critical crossroads in our nation's history. He did get a rough start. He was one of three boys in the family that was left fatherless at the end of the Civil War. Discovering as a teen an enthusiasm for business. What he really wanted to do was work as a merchant. He started his first uh, retail store in 1888 with about $750 and a $500 loan. William Henry Belk went from hardship to greatness. William Henry thought differently and he wasn't afraid to take a risk. And um, if he thought this was the right way to do it, he didn't mind trying it. In the next half hour, we'll look back at the life of William Henry Belk, both his legacy in business and philanthropy, and introduce you to the artist sculpting the statue to honor Belk's impact on our region. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. And from Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for nearly 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello, I'm Tony Zeiss, president of Central Piedmont Community College. You know, the rich and diverse history of the Charlotte region is just wonderful, and we at the college want to bring it to you and share it. We understand the importance of history. We understand the importance of learning from the past so that we can do better in the future. I want to tell you that you're in for a real treat. The History Department at Central Piedmont Community College has partnered with our television station to bring you this special one-of-a-kind history program. Stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Hello, I'm Gary Ritter, and welcome to A Trail of History. Looking around our growing region, it's hard to imagine what life was like just after the Civil War. There was uncertainty about the future, with questions about the economy and society. This was the world in which William Henry Belk embarked on a path that would make him one of the largest retailers in the South. And it started right here in Monroe, North Carolina. But in Baltimore, Maryland, Sculptor Toby Mendez works closely with craftspeople at New Arts Foundry. He's been commissioned to create a bronze statue of William Henry Belt. What started as clay over foam is now wax. Mendez is one step closer to seeing his work cast in bronze. But the real work started many months ago. All of projects like this start with research. And one of the things that I did in terms of doing the research is I went down to Charlotte, North Carolina to meet with uh, members of the Belk family, but also to go through the Belk archives to look at photos. I pull together a group of photographs, and ideally I sit down with the family and we go through the photographs together to pick out what they think are the best representations of uh, their family member. Images that spanned most of Belk's life gave the artist an accurate glimpse of the retail icon's physical features and attire. But Mendez says that's not all he's looking for. You want to make sure that you're not just capturing a likeness, but you have to make sure that the personality of the figure comes through. He pulled specific details from conversations with the family, details which help tell the story of Henry Belk and Bronze. Mendez met with Henry's only daughter, Sarah Belk Gambrell, who he says explained the importance of scissors to a merchant. And she mentioned one of the things that they did was they sold peace goods. And when they sell, sell peace goods, what they're doing is they're selling material to tailors to make suits. So a typical thing for somebody like Belk to carry was a pair of scissors. So those sort of details I try to bring into the sculptures. And so what you'll see in the final sculpture is, is that he is holding a pair of scissors. But images from the Belk archives and discussions with the family weren't the only cues Mendez relied on while creating the sculpture. In determining details on the sculpture, what I started to do is to look at photos of, of people of, of that stature from like the 1920s. 
And studying the photographs of Belk from that time, you know, things like the watch fob, the pair of scissors um, stuck out to me. Um, the, the type of suit that they would wear, you know, with a, a three-piece suit with a vest. Uh, and we would uh, decide whether he was going to wear a bow tie or whether he was going to wear a regular tie. From my perspective, he's a man that really represents um, opportunity. And he's a man who believed in, or he was a man, who believes, believed in hard work and um, could follow a, a dream and make it happen. And I think that's what all of us today still want to believe in, the American dream. William Henry Belk, known to most as Henry, was the middle son of Abel and Sarah Belk. He was born in 1862 on a farm in Lancaster County, South Carolina. According to William Henry Belk's biographer, his father was killed at the end of the Civil War by looting Union troops in a case of mistaken identity. They were actually searching for Henry's grandfather and his alleged stashes of gold. His mother, Sarah, now a widow with three boys to raise, managed to keep the farm going. She instilled in Henry a strong faith and work ethic. His mother was apparently a very strong character. He was dutiful and loving towards her for her all her long life after that. She and, and her religious faith kept that family together and gave him some internal strength to overcome his circumstances. He went through hard times and hard feelings in the, the era of Reconstruction. When Henry was 11, his family left the farm and moved to Monroe, North Carolina. Two years later, his older brother Tom died. About a year after his brother's death, Henry got a job with Monroe merchant B.D. Heath to help support the family. His starting salary, $5 a month. He was not scared of hard work. He grew up on a farm. He lost everything and had to work to get it back. And I've heard people tell the story that he used to say, you know, um, it's not hard for a form farm boy to go out and work and keep working and keep working until what they're after happens. And um, that's about what he did. Feeling a sense of duty as the oldest, Henry did not go to college. Instead, he opted to keep working for Heath. This made it possible for his younger brother John to go to medical school while Henry stayed in Monroe, learning as much as he could about business. He also saw things in the operations of the, the stores that he didn't like that he, he wished could be done differently. Um, because most of the customers were farmers, um, things were sold on a credit basis, and when the farmer got paid for his crop, then he could pay off the store debt, which meant that a lot of times, if the crop were poor or the expenses were too high, um, store owners were left to repossess land and houses and then to impoverish farm families. And he didn't see that as a way of doing business. In May of 1888, Henry Belk opened his first store, the New York Racket, with $750 of his own money and a $500 loan. Unlike most other merchants at the time, he refused to sell on credit, and he offered a money-back guarantee. He trusted the customer. The customer trusted him to give a good price. He trusted them to be honest about, well, it's not the right thing, it didn't fit, it was, it's this or that. Um, and it built good relationships uh, between him and his customers. As the business grew, Henry reached out to his younger brother, John, for help. His brother came to work with him out of necessity. He needed um, some more boots on the ground. And he was going kind of gangbusters at that point, so much so that he convinced his brother to leave a medical practice and come work with him. This early partnership between Henry and John laid the foundation for the Belk Brothers department stores. William Henry Belk's belief in partnering with um, other people that he really had faith in, that he thought shared his values, was another reason that his business was so successful. He believed in mentoring, so he raised up um, uh, employees from stock boys to greater responsibilities until he knew them well enough and thought that they understood his system well enough that they could operate a sister store in another town under his name, of which, of which they would be complete managers with independence, but he would be a part owner. 
if you're willing to invest in the people, they're probably going to return that to your business and ultimately to the community, make the community a better place. So partnerships were important to him and that was how he could build a business one person into over 400 stores at one point. Their second store opened in 1893 in Chester, South Carolina. The business was a 50-50 partnership between the Belk brothers and Alex Klutz. This model of partnership and expansion would continue for nearly a century. If you do have all those different names, now we don't see, now Belk Inc. is really used on all stores, but Belk Hudson, Belk Matthews, Belk Lindsay, Belk Leggett, there were so many across the South. I, that's a question I used to get all the time when I was in college. You know, what is Belk Hudson? What is Belk Luggett? And that second name was really important to everybody in the Belk organization. It was hard when the stores consolidated and the name, other names came off of the buildings. Frank Matthews' family was one of the original Belk partners. He and his brother inherited the Gastonia store after the death of their father. Frank knew Henry personally. Where Mr. Belk, genius was or is, as a result of it, I think that he knew how to pick people and he knew how to train them after he picked them. In addition to being a great merchant, he was a, uh, he understood people. People like families uh, came from uh, hardworking families who were solid Christians in their belief and uh, they wanted to uh, make a success in what they were doing. He was a uh, kind man. He uh, understood young men, how they needed to be trained. Uh, he knew uh, he could look inside of them and get the best out of them. And uh, he did it in a way that uh, made it all really a family. Henry Belk's legacy goes beyond that of just a successful businessman. One of his core beliefs was that um, he had a responsibility to the communities where he did business to give back to them. And um, he wasn't satisfied just to make money for money's sake. He felt that he was developing a business in order to make the whole community a better place. That meant um, founding churches, um, supporting Presbyterian colleges or hospitals. Uh, um, I mean, his, his charity wasn't exclusively denominational, but that was where he looked first. It came from his um, Presbyterian roots, sort of to whom much is given, much is expected, and that you, everybody has an opportunity to give back some of what they receive in their life. So he um, valued the Presbyterian Church and in his life, he built over 300 Presbyterian churches all across the South, and um, that was one of his big legacies. That he set an example, um, not only of good business practices, but of caring about, and caring about his customers, but caring about his employees, and inspiring people with um, that way, that the business could be done not simply as a matter of profit and loss, but as a matter of showing, exemplifying and developing character in others. Back in Baltimore, the foundry workers finalized the wax positives. Finding and addressing any imperfections at this stage is critical before any bronze is poured. Wax positives have been made in the foundry and these are done in sections. And each section, when I see them in wax, what I'm looking for is, is to make sure that where there was a seam, 
or divide in the mold uh, creates a line that's in the wax. I want to make sure that the artisans in the foundry have worked that surface down so that you can't tell where the divisions have occurred. So their expertise is really copying my texture that was in the original clay back into the wax and making sure that it's exactly like what the original clay was. Only a few weeks past the wax stage, molten metal has been poured, and the bronze statue now stands in the foundry workshop. But the work's far from complete. With guidance from Mendez, the artisans do the final metal work and prepare the surface for patination with welding and sandblasting. Patination is a delicate process of chemistry, heat, and artistry that gives the bronze its characteristic finish. It's mid-morning and one week before its official unveiling. The main thing is just bringing in the sculpture safely. The forklift operator carefully crawls along a stretch of the Little Sugar Creek Greenway with the statue of Henry Belk suspended by heavy straps below the forks. And it's here in front of the Metropolitan where artist Toby Mendez starts to install the finished statue with a little help. The process is very smooth, um, you know, we're working with a really great mason, uh, James uh, McCarthy. Members of the Trail of History Committee and Mendez take into consideration every possible way the public might view the statue before deciding on its final orientation and placement. Well, you think about in terms of, uh, you know, views that people will look at this, what what the background is. Uh, you know, it has some cityscape from one angle, it has the greenway from another angle, and as you come down the steps from uh, the center here, uh, Henry Belk looks you straight on. With the decision made, McCarthy uses a power drill fitted with a sharp masonry bit. In his skilled hands, it chews through the stone and concrete footing. Next, anchor bolts get threaded into the statue's base. Then, with McCarthy at the controls of the forklift and guidance from Mendez, the statue is lowered with the four anchor bolts lining up and slipping into holes filled with epoxy. That epoxy will harden and secure the statue to the footing. This is a very exciting time for us. It's an exciting time for Charlotte, and certainly it's an exciting time for uh, the Belt family. We're making history today by honoring a history maker, and that would be, of course, William Henry Belk. A week after installation, members of the Belk family and the Trail of History board gather on the Greenway for the statue's public unveiling. William Henry Belk's granddaughter, Mary Claudia Belk Pylon. In a hundred years, we hope that this statue will remind people of our founder's integrity, innovative spirit, business mind, and legacy of change. Thank you for celebrating this special event with us today. Toby, thank you for this outstanding job you did creating his likeness. In addition, your use of the 1800s retail icons with the scissors and the bolts of fabric are priceless. And after more than a year's worth of work. Very moving. Uh, it's nice to have the Belk family here. One of the special things about a project like this is that because it's a family work, the family comes together for the unveiling. That makes it special. They said that I captured his character and, and his pride and, and, uh, and his likeness, which is very important. It's been a very good reaction. And for artist Toby Mendez, there's even more satisfaction. You know, it's real fun to do a sculpture from that period of history. Uh, you know, there's not that many sculptures that I could think of from like the 19 teens and the 1920s, and it's an era that right now, because that was 100 years ago, is, is being celebrated a little bit more. And that, that kind of makes it 
interesting as an artist to kind of look back 100 years ago of what were things like. Trail of History board member George Dewey was the project leader for the Belk statue. Well, it's, it's rewarding for me and, and the whole Trail of History board. And it, uh, these projects, from the time we signed the contract with the artist till it's in the grounds a year, but it's, it starts long before that. Um, you know, fundraising for it, choosing the artist, and then deciding where on the Greenway uh, the statue should go, what's appropriate for that particular statue in terms of location. So to have this uh, unveiling today and to have the uh, Belk family here and to be, um, uh, to be uh, pleased with the out, uh, outcome is great. And, and to be standing uh, with the John Belk Freeway in the background right behind it uh, shows uh, to the legacy of this family and this community. And it's the Charlotte community, Dewey says, will benefit most from the Belk statue and others along the trail of history. Charlotte, and if you've been here for any five years or, or, or more, you know that we have a difficult time capturing our history. And I think there's, it's important for Charlotte because to balance our pushing forward in our future and remembering our, our past and what our history is. We do a great job of uh, being a very progressive forward-thinking city, uh, but uh, it, it's our history that was sort of the foundation, the roots of our community, and uh, these are the people that made this community what it is. What's interesting is, is the artwork, if it's well done, it becomes a part of somebody else's lives, and somebody else starts to own it and, and talk about it and share stories about it, and it, you know, its true function is, is really to continue to tell the story of, in this case, uh, William Henry Bell. Uh, to me, that's exciting, and it'll go on. Uh, these are people that shaped our community, uh, were leaders in our community in a time before us, and uh, reminding and remembering these people uh, for all the thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are moving to Charlotte now is important. He brought innovation, and he also believed in investing in the people that he worked with. Partnerships were a big um, part of his business, and um, I think today we all kind of agree that it's pretty hard to do something all by yourself. If you're willing to collaborate with other people and um, give them some space to do what they do well, you're probably gonna come out ahead, and that's what he did. We probably will never see another story like the Belt Brothers and what they did. The world uh, won't call for that kind of success story again, I don't believe. And, uh, and for a family who uh, were very good businessmen and uh, very successful at it, but they, their lives and their careers show that you can do that and be successful. And at the same time, be a good citizen, be a good churchman, and be a good mentor, and help people out who need help. William Henry's granddaughter, Mary Claudia, remarked, the statues along the trail of history represent ordinary people who did extraordinary things. Henry Belk did just that. From life on a post-Civil War farm to becoming one of the retail giants of the South, he left a legacy of entrepreneurship and philanthropy. I'm Gary Ritter. Thank you for watching this episode of A Trail of History, right here on WTVI PBS Charlotte. A production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.